Hi, Professor Kavling. Thank you so much for joining us uh, in our inaugural interview of the Women in Machine Learning um, interview series. Uh, I'm Katie Collins. Um, and you were very well known at MIT for teaching the Intro to Machine Learning 6036 course, which I took in the fall uh, and absolutely loved. Uh, and we want to know if you could talk a little bit about how you developed the course, um, how you got involved, uh, what your favorite parts about teaching it are, um, and kind of a little bit on that. Sure. Well, first, thanks a lot for inviting me to come and talk to you uh, as we all sit in our houses and think about machine learning. Um, so let's see, I came to, I used to teach the graduate level machine learning class for quite a while, and we, we didn't have an undergraduate machine learning class. And some colleagues of mine, uh, Tommy Yakwa and Regina Barzila, started 6036. And they taught it for about three semesters, and then they had kind of were done with that and wanted to do something else. And so I and some colleagues kind of took it over and we decided to try to teach it in a different style, which is a style that we had developed in teaching 601, which is a class I could talk about some, but um, we came to believe that at least uh, for teaching and learning purposes that maybe lectures were not the most important thing and that that exercises and homeworks and a good kind of rational progression of problems to solve, uh, that seems to be where the learning happens more, right? So I think professors and students like lectures, it's comfortable for everybody. Professors are used to going up and talking and students are used to kind of reclining in their seats and pretending something's going on. But after that, it's not clear who got what out of that. I mean, there's some social experience and there's some kind of high level stuff, but the number of students who are right with you at this moment when you're doing the technical thing at the board is I think not so many. So we decided to de-emphasize lecturing. In fact, the first time we taught it, we had no lectures and the students complained about that. So we put back one lecture a week that most students don't come to, but they're happy that it exists, I think. Uh, and we really emphasize learning. We, we spend a lot of time on the exercises and the homeworks and the labs. And we really work on making sure that we have a big staff who understands what's going on. So we pour a lot of time into teaching the staff. And then we hope that the students learn by doing exercises and talking to people. So I don't know, that's our strategy. Yeah, I definitely personally appreciated uh, the way that 036 was structured and thought it was phenomenal. Um, I guess we've heard from younger students or people interested in machine learning uh, who might not have access to a course like 036 right away on whether they should start with learning more about the theory or kind of starting with an applied project, something that they're interested in, and then kind of filling in the gaps. Um, so I guess you kind of said your philosophy for describing or for structuring 036, but I'm curious whether you think that students should start on the theory side or start on the applied side and kind of fill in or a mix of both? That's interesting. I think some mix is probably important. Um, the thing is, I guess, I mean, it, it used to be that you couldn't really start on the applied side, but now there's all these neural network packages, right? So you can get the package and you could get the data and you can pour the data into the package and then it'll print some numbers out and you can say, yay. Uh, but you don't know what you just did. And if the numbers aren't the ones that you were hoping for, you have really not much idea of what to do except for make random perturbations to your program. So I think it's really critical to have some idea of what's going on. I think you have to have the idea of overfitting or what should be happening over time or, or those kinds of things. And understanding whether the answer that you get out will be useful. Um, one thing to know is that actually 6036 is completely available for free to everyone uh, at the open learning library. So that uh, MIT has taken some of its classes, including all the online material and all the exercises and the checkers and everything. So uh, people could go and try it out. It's not synchronous, you can do it anytime, but also it's not staffed, there aren't any TAs. And I know in, in 036, I really love the reinforcement learning unit that you had, especially when you drew the little robot um, kind of on the board and its interactions with the environment. Um, I know that kind of relates to your research on making intelligent robots. So I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that. Um, yeah, so I'm happy to do that. I, I have a good couple good stories about that. So 
my first job, so oh, uh, I was an undergraduate at Stanford and I uh, got admitted to the PhD program at the same time that I got a job at SRA, which is a research lab that's a used to be affiliated with Stanford. It technically isn't anymore, but it's right nearby. And so at that research lab, my first job, they were making a robot. And at that point, the people who were making the robot didn't really know anything about robotics. And I knew nothing about robotics, like really zero. And it was my job to program the robot to like go down the hallway and not run into the walls. And it had these terrible little sonar sensors that were very noisy and unreliable and they bounced off the walls and stuff. And uh, I would like try to write a program for the robot to go down the hall and it would crash into the hallway. And then I would bring it back and fix the program and it would try again and it would crash and I would bring it back and I would fix it. For weeks, I worked on this program. And eventually, I learned how to make the robot drive down the hallway. Like, I had a program and it would work. But the lesson that I drew from that was that I shouldn't have been needing to learn about how the sonars worked and all that. Like, if the robot should learn how to go down the hallway, not me. So that is the, was like the formative experience for me for like really wanting to make robots that could learn. Um, and so eventually my PhD thesis was actually in reinforcement learning. So I had a little robot that would roll around and learn to not crash into things. So, so that was kind of good. But then as I looked at the kinds of things that you can do with reinforcement learning, I actually became a lot less enthusiastic about the standard ways that people do reinforcement learning even now. Um, I think they're good for a class of problems that, one way to describe the class of problems that I think reinforcement learning is good for is that it, they're those kinds of things that you couldn't tell someone else how to do. So catching balls and throwing them and playing tennis and juggling and walking are things with a tight kind of perceptual motor control loop. You gotta tune them up and so on. And I think the RL methods are really good for that kind of thing. But I think people are trying to use them for much more complicated and high level things, which probably there's a set of techniques that's, that would be much more effective. So I spend a lot of time now working on learning kind of higher level of abstraction models of the effects of actions so that I can do big, longer horizon, much more complicated problems than you could do with RL. And my favorite example, which I used in a class, it was a homework assignment in a class. Uh, the homework assignment was, um, this was like in a graduate level seminar type class on uh, kind of embodied computation. Uh, the homework assignment was to go to someone else's house and make tea without asking questions. Uh, and the idea is I would like to be able to make a robot that could go to anybody's house and like figure out how to make tea. Uh, and you can do it. But it's not easy and it's not a standard trajectory and you have to think about where do I, how do I make the water hot in this kitchen and where do I find the tea bags or do they have tea in a can or how does it work? So that's what I want to actually think about. And I don't think RL is the right way to do all of that. It's the right way still to learn how to unscrew the thing, you know, but not to do the high level problem. And I guess you've also done some more recent work on curiosity kind of embedded within learning. Do you think that that is kind of a direction forward towards longer horizon problems or kind of interesting learning? Yeah, the curiosity work is, I would say, not on my main line. It's a little bit of a, uh, we, uh, we, we were doing a project with Hondo which was, in, they're interested in curiosity and its role in intelligence. And, um, I think what's interesting is we can think about learning like from the scientific perspective and how is it that like why are children and young animals curious and what was evolution doing like why did, why did evolution wouldn't have put it there if it wasn't good for something so what is it so there's like what is it good for and how do you get to it Right. And so I've done some simple work on thinking about how you might actually, how an evolutionary like process might arrive at something that looks like curiosity, right? Because what's interesting about curiosity 
lots, there's lots of study of information gathering, sort of goal-driven information gathering. That's easy to model scientific, mathematically even. You could say, well, I'm uncertain about the world around me. I'm trying to do this particular job. How can I maximally look in places or do experiments so that I can get information so I can do the thing I'm trying to do? What's interesting about curiosity is that it's pretty clear that the agents that are engaging in curious behavior, like bear cubs or children, they're not like, oh, I need to figure this out in order to do this job right now. They're just, they just like kind of do stuff for fun. It pays off in the long term, but it doesn't feel like they're reasoning through to the payoff. Like they're just doing it, right? So some other mechanism has to have decided that, oh, they should do this now while they have time and freedom and that somehow that will help them develop in a way that will pay off in the longer, longer term. Uh, when I have my kind of roboticist hat on though, I, um, I think about trying to engineer this robot that might go to your kitchen and make tea. And I think it's very important that that robot probably not be doing curious exploration in your kitchen. So uh, you have to kind of modulate those things. So I guess you mentioned you don't think reinforcement learning alone is kind of the way to make a robot that can make tea in your kitchen. Are there other methods or kind of ideas that you look towards um, or kind of modeling frameworks for thinking about that problem or you think could be used in the future? Yeah, so there's, it, it, right, neural networks have so recently been so successful uh, at so many things and reinforcement learning has also been very successful in several cases. And so I think uh, many of us have forgotten a bunch of other things that might be useful. Um, so one important aspect I think is, and I don't know the answer, but figuring out how to, how to remember in a useful way what you know about the world around you that you can't see. So much of the work right now in reinforcement learning and other kinds of things is about an image or an instantaneous, almost instantaneous mapping from what you can see to what you should do. But if I'm looking around the house, then I've looked in these three places or I've tried turning the water handle to the left and that didn't work. Or, and, and my history is really important actually to me. And you could say, oh, history, yeah, I make an RNN and I just remember some stuff and then that'll do the job. And in theory it could, but I suspect that in order to get these things to work in finite time, some design of memory structures for what you've seen and what you've done that are articulated in terms of like objects and, and, and properties of things in the world. Uh, I mean, I know that you work in a kind of science lab, right? And so I think that it's pretty agreed upon that uh, you know, humans, when they're born, and even I think other mammals, have some conceptualization of the world in terms of objects, like that that's a kind of a built-in thing. And I think that we should build that into our robots. Um, and so, and then how do you have a memory that's in terms of objects? And how do you update that when you need it and how do you use it to do your behavior. So that's one thing that I think is really important. Another thing is longer horizon reasoning. Um, so you could make a plan to do a very complicated job. You could move all the contents of your house across the country or across the world. And that's an incredibly complicated thing, which you obviously couldn't just plan or execute at the level of motor behaviors, right? I mean, you can't just say, oh, let me work out the trajectory, which is me moving somewhere. So you have to think hierarchically and you have to deal with uncertainty. You have to understand right now that you don't know how much it costs to move or whether trucks can carry bicycles or, I mean, I don't know what it is. There's lots you don't know, but you have the capacity to reason about what you don't know explicitly gather information, do what you need to do, and so on. So I think representing what you know, reasoning over the long horizon, being able to take actions to gather information, those are things that are really important. And I guess you'd mentioned earlier that you don't really like the term machine learning per se to cover all of um, kind of those things in the work that you do. So I was wondering if you could help clarify that for people, myself included, who might be a little bit confused on 
the scope of the terminology kind of relation to AI and uh, other ideas. I see. Yeah, for some reason, I'm not exactly sure why. Well, maybe because machine learning, again, it has suddenly come to the fore and it works so well. But I mean, machine learning, I take to be a set of tools and techniques that are some combination of statistics goal understanding and algorithms for optimization and so on and uh, uh, and some theoretical ideas really about how it is that data can represent some process in the outside world and how you can do generalization and how you can do induction how is it that you can see 12 cases of something and then make a prediction about the 13th right so that has uh, statistical and philosophical foundations even, right? So all that. So machine learning is a super important area and I care a lot about it, but it is not all of AI in my view, right? So some of AI is the, the study of representation, the study of longer horizon reasoning and planning and so on. And those things don't necessarily involve learning. So it's, I just think that kind of AI is a bigger thing and learning is a very important part of it. Also that there are many important kinds of learning that are not neural networks. And uh, that's also a thing that we've, I think many uh, people have lost touch about. Um, so, uh, so there's a broad set of techniques and I'm, I think that they'll, many of them or all of them be important. We'll have to figure out how to put them together in order to really like make AI. I guess you've kind of touched on this as well, but is there something that excites you most about kind of your research and the field of intelligent robotics uh, going forward? Well, so I do think that the, the huge success in learning lately has given everybody like more optimism and enthusiasm. And so that's really good. Um, and it is clear, it is true that back when it felt like engineers had to write down everything, that that was kind of a terrifying prospect, right? So I think now the thing that, that I'm most motivated by is, is understanding the trade-off, right? So we know that if we took a totally generic, enormous recurrent neural network, and trained it for long enough with enough data, it could probably do whatever we wanted it to do. But the long enough and the enough data might be completely unapproachable, right? We might just never get enough data or have enough time or whatever. And so what we know from the theory of machine learning is that if you build in some structure and some bias that matches your problem appropriately, then you need less data, then you need less training. And Convolutional neural networks are a super good example of that. Right? So the idea there is that if you organize your machine learning algorithm, if it's taking images as input, you organize it in a special way that really takes quite seriously the fact that it is getting images as input. So that for instance, if you see a cat in the upper left-hand corner, it's gonna look the same as if you see a cat down here. Uh, and so understanding some basic principles that let you design learning algorithms so that the algorithms are efficient and so that the things that we have to design are what's good, what humans are good at designing, right? So there's some things that human engineers are good at, maybe getting the overall structure. Some things are terrible at, like what should the weights be, right? Humans could never do that. But algorithms are good at hopefully, hopefully at the complement. And if we figure out how to put those pieces together, then I, then I think that's what will take us far. You talked about the moment in your uh, past like experience at SRI to get into robotics and why you fell in love with it, but I know you majored in philosophy in undergrad. Can you talk a bit about your trajectory kind of getting to SRI and then going into a PhD program in CS um, and kind of that route? Yeah, I mean, it's actually a lot less exciting than it sounds. So I was an undergraduate at Stanford, and when I was an undergraduate at Stanford, which was between 1979 and 1983, they didn't even have an undergraduate major in computer science, which was interesting. So I didn't know about computers though when I showed up, and I, or I kind of knew about them. I programmed in basic on a thing once, but anyway. Um, 
I thought I was going to be a math major. That was kind of like my plan. And I went to a terrible, terrible high school. Oh, such a terrible high school. It's hard to imagine. Anyway, I got there and I couldn't really get into the interesting math classes because so I, I did math, but I didn't major in math. Uh, but I took some philosophy classes and the, the professors were articulate and interesting and the thoughts were deep and hard and I liked it a lot. And it turns out that there is a branch of philosophy, many people don't know this, but there's a branch of philosophy, analytic philosophy, which shades into logic, which is almost part of math. So it's not like moral philosophy or sort of like reasoning about what's right and true, but more like, what does it mean to have percepts and how, what's the relationship between like what hits your eyes and the world out there and how do you think about that? And how do you think about uncertainty and knowledge? And how do you think about the semantics of language? And that connects up to logic, which is straight up math and set theory and that kind of stuff. So Stanford had a sub major within philosophy that was very technical. So in some sense, that's what I did. And that was like perfect background for starting AI. Um, and, uh, and so, and at the same time, I started to do a computer science, like kind of like an MNG-ish thing. Um, so I, I was, I took quite a few computer science classes as an undergraduate. So that's, that's, that's how I went. So it's not like I was just doing kind of abstract philosophy and then suddenly switched. I guess, do you have any recommendations for students that might be interested in getting into AI? If there's any books that they should read or I know your course is online, so you could go to that. Yeah, but that's very, not, that's very technical. It's not like inspiring at the high level. That is a really good question. And I don't know the answer. I mean, I was completely inspired by a book that like only a certain segment of a certain kind of nerdy person likes, but I will tell you about it because maybe some of those people will be listening. So there's this book called Girdle, like G-O-D-E-L. He's a logician, Escher. So he's an artist who makes interesting, thought-provoking patterns. And Bach, who's a musician who makes interesting, thought-provoking music. Uh, and it's this crazy reflection on pattern and recursion and thought and representation. And that totally influenced me about AI. Um, now, the question is, what are the popular books at this moment? So that was from, I read it like the summer before I went to college. So I read it in 1979. Uh, the question is, what are the current current cool books? And I don't know. That's that I, I th that's a gap in my knowledge. Sorry. That's okay. I also have that book at home, and I've read sections of it, uh, but I need to go back and read all of it, uh, especially well now. So, thank well, you. Summer is a good time for that book. You couldn't read it while you were really occupied with other stuff. Yeah, yeah it's it's very very uh, big. But <laughs> yeah, um, and I guess, do you have any broad advice for students that might be interested in pursuing machine learning or AI um, kind of going forwards? Um, well, so actually, I mean, you asked me before about would I encourage people to do theory or practice? And I think you wanted, you, always want to do a mix of both, but I think it's really important to remember that the tools and techniques of this moment will not persist. Uh, so you might say to yourself, oh, I'm just going to go read about, oh, TensorFlow. Oh, but no, TensorFlow is passe now, so something else, right? Um, so I'm going to go read about this and I'm going to read some blog posts and I'm, I'm going to make myself into a machine learning person. I think doing some of that is good, but you, it'd be very important not to mistake that for actually understanding the principles because the, there's some kind of underlying mathematical and algorithmic and statistical principles, which is the kind of the truth. And that's the set of tools we have right now. So the tools are gonna change. So uh, fine to do both, but not okay to do only, I think, the, the current tool-based stuff. And you know, I 
I'm for math, right? So st study math and algorithms, and that will just keep paying off. Um, yeah. So thank you. Those were our uh, main questions. Um, that was really fascinating talking to you. Um, you gave a lot of good insights for us going forward um, and anyone who would be watching this. So thank you so much for joining right. us. You're uh, welcome. We really appreciate it. Thank Love you. Thanks. Right. Bye. Bye.